Hello, everybody. Welcome to Polymerase Chain Reaction, the not so basics. My name is Lexa Scuppum. I am a uh, microbiologist with the Center for Veterinary Biologics. I'm in the virology section. I've been doing real time PCR and PCR for about 30 years. And the purpose of this lecture series is to download as much of the information that I've accumulated as possible. This is a four seminar series. The second one is about how to design primers and probes. The third seminar is about real-time PCR. And the fourth seminar is about troubleshooting PCRs. So I hope that you can attend those seminars as well. First off, I need to do a little disclaimer here. Um, I am a federal employee, but anything that I say here, any of my opinions are not endorsed by the government. They are just opinions that I have generated during my career. Okay, so what is PCR? It's basically just a way to make a lot of copies of a small piece of DNA. So a gene that you are interested in manipulating you need to isolate away from the rest of the genome and generate enough copies that you can successfully sequence it, clone it, etc. For this seminar, the overview is going to be uh, how PCR works, including the reagents in detail and how those reagents interact with one another the different available thermocyclers and their uses, their um, pluses and minuses. And then I'm going to show you the characteristics of the amplification in detail. PCR has been one of the most important developments in molecular biology. Um, Kerry Mullis developed it many years ago and received a Nobel Prize for it. It is the basis of a lot of different technologies that we use in the medical field, in law enforcement, in uh, development of medicines. So for instance, uh, there is a new medication out for or a new gene therapy for muscular dystrophy. There have recently been reports in the literature of the treatment for sickle cell anemia, a gene-based therapy treatment for sickle cell anemia appears to be very successful. Recently, uh, the genomics databases, such as uh, 23andMe, those sequences that are also developed by PCR have been used for forensic analysis, uh, solving cold cases. And most recently, there is a lot of talk about how PCR, real-time PCR specifically, is being used to diagnose COVID-19. In research, PCR has a lot of different applications at a uh, fine level of detail. So it can be used for mutagenesis. It can be used for cloning, phylogenetic analysis, so how different organisms are related to one another, expressing proteins, so cloning a gene of interest in a manner in which you can generate a lot of the relevant protein mapping genomes, and the, all of the different whole genome sequencing methods that we have available to us are grounded in basic PCR applications. There are different types of PCR that are used for those different applications. Real-time PCR is the method that we will be talking about in the third seminar. RT-PCR, which is not the same as real-time PCR. It stands for reverse transcription PCR, which is the 
modification or the development of cDNA from mRNA in a cell. If you want to do PCR on an RNA target, you must first produce DNA from the mRNA. And so there are real-time PCR RT, so QRT PCR methods, which is real-time amplification of RNA templates. Inverse PCR lets you determine where your known sequence, for instance, has landed inside a genome. So you know the sequence of your gene of interest, but you don't know where in the genome that is. And so inverse PCR allows you to figure that out. Megaprimer PCR is used to change DNA sequences if you have the uh, DNA on a plasmid, for instance. Multiplex PCR allows you to amplify multiple targets simultaneously in the same tube. Nested PCR is for amplification of low copy number targets. It's also used if the PCR primers are not particularly good primers. Nested PCR is not a method that's used a lot these days. But if you need to amplify a low copy number target and you cannot develop really high quality primers because of where in the genome your, your target is, for example, a nested PCR might be a route for you to take. Overlap extension PCR is a way for splicing pieces of synthetic DNA together or for making deletions in DNA. Anchored PCR, if you only want to generate single-stranded product, if you want to use that as a uh, probe for southern blotting or something like that. LAMP stands for Loop Mediated, Mediated Isothermal Amplification. It is a method of PCR that uses a polymerase that has a has no five prime to three prime exonuclease activity. So it is able to amplify a circular piece of DNA over and over, making a very long PCR product that is the concatenation of that circular piece of DNA. Uh, LAMP is being used for diagnostic test kits recently um, because they are easily used in the field and places where you cannot take a thermocycler easily. Digital droplet PCR is a method in which the individual target molecules of DNA are isolated in lipid droplets along with the primers and nucleotides and everything that is necessary. And inside those droplets, PCR proceeds. Those droplets then are filed in front of a camera that will determine how many of the droplets actually contain amplicons. And this method is being used to identify uh, different alleles of genes in different patients. Okay, so uh, I have a video here that is the real basics of how PCR works. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of feeding and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, 
the enzyme fat polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the prime sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. Okay, great. I will uh, get into that a little bit later on, um, but that is the basics of what happens. And then the billions of copies of DNA that have been generated, you then use in your downstream applications for sequencing or cloning or whatever. One of the first steps that you do after running a PCR is to visualize the amplicon to make sure that the PCR performed the way you predicted that it would. So in these pictures, you see a slab of agarose gel where the PCR product is loaded into wells and DNA is negatively charged. So after the DNA is in the wells, um, it's suspended in a salt buffer an electrical current is applied and the DNA is separated out by size as it travels through the agros towards the positive node of the gel box. In the bottom right, you see a photo of a gel exposed to UV light. The DNA has been stained with ethidium bromide, which is a chemical that intercalates into the DNA structure. And in this particular gel, you can see on the left most well, a DNA size standard ladder. And then there are, uh, in the second lane, a small piece of DNA. And in the third lane, a large piece of DNA. So you can see that the DNA is separated out by size with the smallest moving the fastest through the agarose. A good PCR, a well-designed, um, good primers with a template that does not contain a lot of PCR inhibitors can give you amplification of as little as one copy of your target. That will generate a product that is visible on a gel. Now you do have to have good eyes but it is visible. And in this picture, you see a dilution series down to one copy. On the uh, second lane, the band is really fat. And when you get a fat band and you need to figure out how large that band was, so did you get amplification of the DNA size that you were expecting? Do you measure from the top of that band or do you measure from the bottom of that band? The, the appropriate way to do it is to measure across from the top of the band over to the ladder to figure out how big your product is. A PCR reaction contains many different reagents. And um, in addition to your template DNA, you're going to have DNTPs, which are the building blocks of DNA. So individual DNTPs that will be assembled into the correct order of the gene of interest. You have two specific oligonucleotide primers, so small pieces of DNA that sit down onto your target and create a place for the polymerase to bind and start creating that second strand. Polymerase itself, which is here denoted as TAC DNA polymerase. And then the entire reaction requires 
buffered salt solution to proceed. I'm going to start discussing these reagents from smallest to largest so that you can understand how the different parts of the reaction build upon one another and how the biochemistry of the reaction proceeds. If you understand the biochemistry, you are far more likely to be able to troubleshoot when problems arise. So starting with the DNTPs, these are the building blocks of DNA. They come in four flavors, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, guanine sorry. Um, those four flavors can be divided into two different groups, pyrimidines, which include a pyrimidine ring attached to the sugar. Purines contain the pyrimidine ring, but that ring is also fused to an imidazole ring. And so thymine and cytosine are pyrimidines, adenine and guanine are purines. When you look at a nucleotide specifically, it is composed of three different regions. The base, so adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, that is attached to a sugar that forms the backbone of the DNA. That sugar also is attached to a triphosphate, so a linear collection of three phosphate molecules. The, uh, the DNTPs all have a directionality to them that is intrinsic to the chemical structure. And that chemical structure is based on the sugar molecule itself. So if you remember from chemistry, the carbons in sugar are labeled one, two, three, four, and then here is a fifth carbon. So the hydroxyl of this sugar is on the third carbon. So this is considered the three prime end of a DNTP. This triphosphate is attached to the fifth carbon and so is considered the five prime end of the DNTP. So all of the DNTPs have this three prime to five prime directionality associated. Now, if you are looking to purchase different versions of nucleotides, um, different experiments require different things. And if you go to a Sigma catalog, it can be really confusing to determine which molecule it is that you actually need to purchase. So here's a graphic describing the different names. Um, the base, the base attached to just the sugar itself is called a nucleoside. If you need just the alpha phosphate attached, then you are purchasing the nucleotide. If you have two of the three phosphates attached to the sugar, then that is a nucleoside diphosphate. And then finally, a DNTP itself, nucleotide triphosphate, is this entire molecule. There's another level of confusing nomenclature. DATP is not the same thing as ATP, but they are very closely related. The only difference is that DATP is lacking this hydroxyl on the number two carbon that ATP possesses. Um, the roles of these two molecules are very different, DATP being a building block of DNA, whereas ATP is the storage molecule for energy within cells. Okay, so primers then are DNTPs that are linked together to form a very short piece of DNA. So maybe 20 nucleotides long. And on this right-hand picture, you can see how the different DNTPs are attached to one another to make DNA. So in this case, the 
three prime to five prime functionality starts to become apparent. The three prime hydroxyl of one nucleotide has reacted with the alpha phosphate of the adjacent nucleotide forming that bond between the two sugars. Because of the arrangement or the order in which the bases end up, this provides the specificity for a primer to attach to a particular target of DNA. Primers themselves are usually chemically synthesized, but they can be generated um, in vivo, naturally, or by other methods. The template DNA that is used in PCR generally is DNA that has been extracted from and purified from a target cell. So all of the lipids and proteins that are in a given cell could contribute to interfering with the PCR reaction itself. So you want to clean the DNA away from those lipids and proteins as much as possible. Now, there is a way to do PCR on whole cells. This is not something that I recommend to be used very often, but it is a way that I screen clones. If I need to screen um, insertions into a plasmid that I have transformed into E. coli, I will toothpick individual colonies into 50 microliters of water and vortex that so that the cells are in suspension and use one or two microliters of that cell suspension as the template in my DNA reaction. Because there are so many copies of a plasmid in an E. coli cell, this method works well for screening clones, but it is not a method that you ordinarily want to use when you are doing a PCR. So template DNA, we looked at single-stranded DNA when we were talking about the primers, but template DNA is bidirectional, double-stranded. And this picture shows that the, the strands are anti-parallel to one another. So the five prime to three prime ends are in opposite directions. The, uh, the phosphate and the sugars provide the backbone or the, the legs of the ladder where the bases create the rungs across the ladder or the way the two backbones are attached to one another. Guanine is always going to match with cytosine because there are areas for three hydrogen bonds to be made between those two bases. Thymine and adenine will always pair because there are two places for hydrogen bonds to be made. When DNA is extended, what happens is a chemical reaction between the three prime hydroxyl and the alpha phosphate. This reaction kicks out the, sec the, the beta and the gamma phosphates, generating a pyrophosphate and then the, the bond between the two nucleotides is formed. Pyrophosphate can be combined with other chemicals to produce light, and so is one method for measuring accumulation of PCR product in a reaction. The way that the three prime hydroxyl and the alpha phosphate how that bond is made involves two magnesiums that are contained on the polymerase protein. So in this picture, the uh, pink labels indicate amino acids that are part of the polymerase, and the two required magnesiums are shown here 
in green. The DNA template is shown at the top with the extending DNA strand in blue, whereas the incoming nucleotide in this picture is in red. And here you see that the two magnesiums are responsible for pulling charge along that phosphate chain. So the magnesium destabilizes those interactions and charge is pulled from the beta phosphate to the gamma phosphate and charge is also pulled from the alpha phosphate to the beta and that allows this hydroxyl um, phosphate bond to be formed. This picture is actually a picture of RNA polymerase and you know that because this base has a, a hydroxyl on the second, not just the, the three prime carbon, but also the two prime carbon. And that is indicative of an RNA polymerase. Okay, so I've been mentioning polymerase and I will often just refer to it as TAC. That's because the first polymerases that were identified and used for PCR were generated from a microbe called Thermus aquaticus. So TAQ uh, is where the TAC name came from. And these molecules live at very high temperatures. Because they are used to working in high temperatures, um, they are useful in PCR because high temperatures are a required part of that reaction. The polymerase, the TAC polymerase proteins themselves come from a single high GC content gene. So these genes are very stable at high temperatures. And TAC is what is, is the molecule required for producing the second strand of DNA at high temperature. TAC works optimally at about 75 degrees Celsius, but it is stable up to 90, 95 degrees Celsius. That is the temperature necessary for separating two strands of genomic DNA so that the PCR reaction can continue. Polymerase in vitro, so in a PCR reaction, is capable of copying about one gene in about one minute. In vivo, in cells, this happens much more quickly. Okay, so here is a picture of TAC polymerase. Um, the, the amino acid chains that are folded up in a secondary and tertiary structure to make the three-dimensional protein is shown as the multicolored uh, kind of zigzagging lines here. And if you refer to the picture on the right, this is considered the right-hand model of polymerase. So the line diagram in the center, you can imagine the pink is the wrist of the molecule. The yellow is the palm of the molecule. The green is the thumb of the molecule and the blue and the pink constitute the fingers of the molecule. And the thumb is responsible for binding the minor groove of the incoming duplex DNA. So where the primer is attached to the single-stranded template DNA is the locus that the thumb region binds. The fingers part of the molecule is necessary for the um, positioning the incoming DNTP and putting it in the right place so that the phosphate bond can be formed to extend the primer and continue uh, generating that second piece of DNA. The piece of DNA itself is shown as these orange lines 
And it's very difficult to see in this instance um, how the, the DNA is situated, but if you extrapolate to the picture over here, it makes a lot more sense. DNA polymerase faithfully replicates DNA. DNA polymerase faithfully replicates DNA by using the nucleotide sequence of the template strand, colored gray, to select each new nucleotide to be added to the three prime family of the graph strand, colored yellow. The different domains of DNA sequence are colored differently. Before a nucleotide can be incorporated into DNA, at the three prime end of the ground strand, the blue finger domain of the glimmers moves inward to correctly position the nucleoside triphosphate. A carbon phosphate group is released when each nucleotide is added. In this view, the details of nucleotide selection at the active site are shown, with the incoming nucleoside triphosphate and the template nucleotide in light blue. The ground strand is green and the template strand is red. When the finger domain moves inward, the nucleoside triphosphate is tested for its ability to form a proper base pair with the template nucleotide. When the base pair forms, the active site residues catalyze the covalent addition of the new nucleotide under the three prime hydroxyl group on a growing strand, and the entire process repeats and speeds up to 500 nucleotides per second. On rare occasions, approximately once every 10,000 nucleotide additions, the polymerase makes an error and incorporates a nucleotide that does not form a proper base pair onto the end of the growing strand. When this occurs, the polymerase changes conformation and transfers the end of the growing strand to a second active site on the polymerase, where the erroneous added nucleotide is removed. The polymerase then flips back to its original conformation, allowing polymerization to continue. As a result, such a self-correcting DNA polymerase will make a mistake only about once every 10 to 7 to 10 to 8 nucleotide pairs. Okay, great. So, TAC polymerase has a number of intrinsic characteristics that are necessary for the functions that we just watched. It has to be thermostable because of the necessary temperature changes that are required for um, separating out the two strands of the template DNA and then allowing the primers to bind. Another characteristic that TAC has is processivity. So how far along the strand it can continue to proceed while adding nucleotides. Speed, so how fast can the TAC move? Fidelity, how, um, how perfect is the addition of the new nucleotides in the correct sequence? And specificity. So processivity is a measure of the number of nucleotides that any given polymerase can add to an extending strand before it falls off. So there are different kinds of polymerase and some of them have higher processivities than others. The higher processivity molecules um, have some resistance to PCR inhibitors so they do a better job if your DNA cannot be purified well. Um, they are also better for amplifying long templates than the low processivity versions of polymerase. The fidelity of the polymerase is based on that uh, red wrist region, the three, five, th three prime to five prime exonuclease. So if a nucleotide is incorporated wrong, 
then the exonuclease can go back and fix that mistake. And different polymerases have different abilities in the exonuclease arena. There are, is also the five prime to three prime exonuclease. So if a polymerase is moving along the DNA strand, adding nucleotides, and it hits a region of DNA that is double-stranded. So something has not completely denatured when you heated your DNA up to 95 degrees. The polymerase, instead of just falling off, will actually cut the second strand out of the, um, the blockaded route and um, it will continue to produce a fresh strand rather than either falling off or combining the two strands. It knocks that top strand off and continues synthesis. And this is a functionality that is necessary for TACMAN real-time PCR, and we will talk about that um, in the third seminar. There is also polymerase that available for use that, uh, that does not have the five prime to three prime exonuclease. And these kinds of polymerases are used for the LAMP PCRs, the uh, PCR that is all performed at one temperature. And this is useful for amplifying circular DNAs. The top strand that the polymerase runs into is just peeled off instead of being destroyed. And so then you end up with a long DNA molecule that consists of concatomers of the, that circular sequence. Many polymerases also have a functionality where they add an extra adenine onto the three prime end of the DNA, the molecule that is being synthesized. They, A, has nothing to do with the actual sequence that the template uh, recommends, but the A can be used for cloning into different vectors. So there are vectors like PGMT or TOPO-TA. These are plasmids that you purchase linearized that have single T overhangs at the ligation site. And those T overhangs then can interact with the A overhangs on the DNA uh, on the amplicon and facilitate ligation and cloning. So this is a, uh, a function that some polymerases have. And if you are interested in doing TA cloning, then you need to make sure that you're using the right polymerase. Polymerase specificity then is about making sure that TAC is only going to amplify the fragment that is delineated by your primers. So to do that, TAC can work. It works best at 72, 75 degrees, but it can work at room temperature. So if you have added your TAC to your reaction on the bench, um, it can proceed to make DNA even though the template has not been uh, denatured yet. So hot start TAC has been generated. There are, are a number of different kinds. So it requires that initial 95 degree heating that denatures your DNA to allow the TAC to perform its function. Um, hot start TACs come as antibodies that bind the polymerase, sometimes the polymerase is bound up in a wax bead so it cannot perform on your template. But in general, it 
means that you end up with a much cleaner amplicon so that you, you have not included off-target amplifications in your final product. So there are different kinds of tack that are available for purchase. And here are four different ones with some of their functionalities compared to one another. Um, so basic TAC polymerase has the five prime to three prime exonuclease, so it can be used for standard TACMAN real-time PCR. It has a pretty good fidelity rate, so you can expect to only get one um, misincorporation of a nucleotide per maybe gene, one, one mismatch per gene. The elongation rate is pretty standard, and it does cause the, uh, the A's to be added onto the three prime end. So with a standard TAC, that is good for both uh, real-time PCR and it is good for amplicon cloning. Platinum TAC um, has a high processivity, so it's good for long nuclear or long amplicons because the tack does not fall off. It also means that you can um, and platinum tack then also has the three prime A additions that allow cloning. Vent polymerase has the ability to bust through very high GC rich molecules. And it also has that strand displacing ability. So vent polymerase is good for uh, isothermal PCR. Fusion TAC is really good in the fidelity department. So if you need for your amplicons to not have any errors, then fusion tack is a good one to go with. It also proceeds very fast. So it is good for making very large pieces of DNA into amplicons. All of these different kinds of tack are produced the same way. Um, a gene is cloned into E. coli and the tack protein is expressed and then purified. So it is possible for TAC to be contaminated with E. coli DNA. And that is something to keep in mind if your work focuses around E. coli. So make sure that you include your negative controls in your PCR reactions. Finally, the salt buffer that is included with every tube of TAC now that you purchase. Different TAC polymerases require different matrices for their different functionalities. And so these 10X buffers are not interchangeable. So if you have a TAC from Roche and a TAC from Kyogen, those buffers are not interchangeable. But if you have two different kinds of polymerase from Roche, those two buffers are also not interchangeable. In general, the salts that are included is a, a pH buffer to keep the reaction at an appropriate pH. Magnesium, because remember, magnesiums are required for polymerase to be able to add the incoming nucleotides to the extending strand and also non-acetylated BSA. Most laboratories have a tub of Sigma BSA in a closet somewhere. That is acetylated BSA, which will actually inhibit PCR. You want to use the non-acetylated BSA that is included with the TAC buffers. And it provides an environment that um, can protect polymerase from different PCR inhibitors that are co-purified with DNA. So how much of each of these reagents? 
because these come as buffer mixes, 10x buffer mixes these days, um, you may feel that you don't necessarily need to know this information, but PCR can be used for many different things, and there are times when you need to troubleshoot your PCR. There are also times when you need to modify your PCR for different functionalities, and knowing what is in the 10x buffer is important for that. So the concentration of TRIS is pretty standard because its function is standard, but the concentration of magnesium is going to depend on not just the purpose of your reactions, but also what PCR inhibitors might be brought along with your isolated template. For the same reason, the BSA composition of your reactions might change depending on uh, what inhibitors are co-purified with your template DNA. DNTPs, generally about 200 micromolar of each of the four. TAC, generally, um, you want to have about one and a quarter units worth of TAC in a reaction. Um, sometimes you have to increase the TAC concentration. Again, that is going to be a PCR inhibitor problem. The primers also, uh, concentrations of primers can change how well your reaction performs. So generally you want about you know, 0.1 to 0.5 micromole of each of your primers or, and or your probe if you're doing real time. Um, but sometimes you are going to have to modify the concentrations to get perfect amplification or to get the best amplification possible. Finally, the template that you add in is going to depend largely on what that template type is. So if you are working with a plasmid, you don't have very much DNA that is going into each possible target. So you may have many, many copies of your gene of interest in a very small amount of DNA. So in one picogram of plasmid DNA, you may have thousands or millions of copies of your gene of interest already. Um, if you are using a genomic template, however, you need to use more DNA because there are going to be fewer copies of your target of interest per nanogram of DNA that you add to your reaction. So a standard PCR reaction, here is the recipe for a 100 microliter reaction. Um, these days, I only do 20 microliter reactions, and then I load 10 microliters of that onto my gel. That leaves 10 microliters left over if I want to use that amplicon for a downstream process, or if for some reason my gel doesn't work, I have some left over to run again, as opposed to having to run the whole PCR again. Okay, so thermocyclers come in many different varieties. When Kerry Mullis was first learning how to do PCR, he was using water baths. And so uh, water baths exist that you can set to three different temperatures or um, you can just use two temperatures like with real-time PCR if you have designed your primers to work in that fashion. Um, most thermocyclers that you see these days are block thermocyclers. So like these two down here at the bottom, the PCR tubes sit down into an aluminum block and the thermocycler then changes the temperature of that block up and down from 95 degrees down to 55 in cycles according to your reaction instructions. Um, and that, that changing of the aluminum blocks temperature takes a certain amount of time, of lag time. So many thermocyclers allow you to control how fast that ramping 
goes. Ordinarily, you just set that ramp time to as fast as possible. Um, I have never used a ramp time that is slower than as fast as possible because the faster the reaction goes, the more like physiological conditions you are approaching and the better the polymerase works. Because of that, I really like using these Idaho Tech cyclers. Idaho Tech still makes thermocyclers. They don't make this brand anymore. Um, but this, in, in this thermocycler, your reaction is housed in glass capillary tubes instead of plastic tubes. So your reaction is in a long, thin configuration that the temperature can be changed very quickly. And instead of putting your reaction into an aluminum block, your reaction is suspended into a chamber and the temperature of the air in that chamber is changed with the use of a halogen light bulb. And so these reactions can go very, very fast. And because of the speed of the reactions, often a PCR that will not work in a block thermocycler will work in an Idaho Tech rapid cycler. And so if you have access to one of these, I definitely recommend you give them a shot. So what happens in vitro is very different than what happens in vivo. And so here's just a, a chart kind of comparing in vitro to in vivo. Um, in vivo, RNA is going to perform the priming rather than the synthetic DNA oligos that we use for PCR. Also, a protein called helicase is responsible for separating the two strands of template DNA rather than using heat because, of course, in vivo, you're going to be at a constant temperature. In vivo, you are looking to amplify very long templates and not very many copies. Whereas with PCR, we are looking for a lot of copies of a very short template. In, uh, in vivo, the protein primase is responsible for binding the primers, these RNA primers, onto the template. And with PCR, we use the change in temperature to determine whether or not a primer has annealed onto the temperature. In addition, in vivo, polymerase works much more quickly, as I mentioned. So in PCR, you're going to set your annealing times to be about one kb per minute. So if your amplicon is one gene long or about one kb, your elongation time needs to be about a minute. Whereas in vivo, that same length of DNA can be amplified in a second. Also in vivo, polymerase has a much lower error rate than in PCR. Okay, so back to the basics. Now we've talked about all of the different pieces and how they fit together. Back to the basics. Um, a, a PCR starts with double-stranded template that is separated into two single strands by a increase of the reaction temperature up to 90 to 95 degrees. This does not have to be a very long period of time. Um, you want the period of time to be long enough to melt any secondary structure that the DNA may have but you don't want it to be long enough that the DNA starts to be damaged. The temperature is then dropped down generally to about 55 degrees, depending on the sequences of your primers. So the annealing temperatures of your primers that we'll talk about tomorrow determine what this annealing temperature needs to be. The lowest annealing temperature that I have used is 48 degrees, and that is for primers that amplify uh, 16S bacterial ribosomal genes when I am working with a sample like 
a soil sample where I am trying to amplify all of the different species using a single primer pair. Those primers are designed to very conserved regions in the DNA, but they're not completely conserved. And so those primers are not necessarily going to bind perfectly. And with the imperfect binding, that requires a very low annealing temperature. The higher the annealing temperature, the more specific the binding is going to be. The temperature is then raised after the primers have bound to 72 degrees, which is when the polymerase binds onto that double-stranded, single-stranded junction that's made by the primer binding. And polymerase then extends that second strand for both of the original strands. So after the first cycle, you have two copies of your target sequence. After the second cycle, you have four copies of your target sequence, but only two of those are single-stranded pieces of DNA that are bounded by the two primers of interest. It's not until the third cycle of amplification that you get individual pieces of DNA that are available for cloning or other downstream applications. Um, by the third cycle, you are only at eight copies, so that is not enough for cloning, for instance. But a standard PCR is going to have this temperature cycling happen about 35 times. And after about 35 cycles, you're going to get about a billion copies of your target of interest. So at 20 cycles, you have maybe a million copies of your target at 30 cycles, about a billion copies. If you are worried about the polymerase misincorporating nucleotides into your target of interest, you can use a lower cycle number so that you have fewer possibilities for the polymerase to have incorporated a wrong nucleotide. So sometimes it's recommended that you drop your cycle number down to 15, but you're going to perform either larger volume reactions or many more reactions and combine them and then purify your amplicons using, for instance, a Kyogen uh, quick clean kit uh, to get all of the nucleotides and polymerase out and also to concentrate your amplicon. So here is a picture of a real-time PCR output. Um, on the x-axis, you can see the cycle number. So this reaction went for 50 cycles, not the standard 35. And the green curves indicate the accumulation of PCR product over time. So you start off with very few copies. So you start off with one, and then at the next cycle, you're at two, and the next cycle, you're at four, and then you're at eight. And then because it's a logarithmic amplification, you get this inflection point. And if your reaction happens with 100% PCR efficiency, then it is theoretically possible to get 10 to the 11th final copies of your amplicon after your 35, or in this case, 50 cycles. But I want you to notice that these curves flatten out and the flattening out does not necessarily happen at the same time. The flattening out is stochastic. It has to do with whether or not your polymerase has been heated for too long, too many times, the polymerase will stop working, or you can run out of nucleotides, or your um, PCR inhibitors have finally 
um, during the cycling locked up your DNA so it won't amplify anymore. Um, so the 100% the reaction efficiency for the full 35 cycles is not something that is likely to happen. So although you are theoretically going to get 3.4 times 10 to the 11th copies, you're actually going to get far fewer. Okay, so a question I get a lot is, which is more sensitive, conventional PCR or real-time PCR? The literature would have you believe that real-time PCR is more sensitive than conventional PCR. But I already mentioned that a well-designed conventional PCR can give you sensitivity down to one template copy per reaction. And it has been known since Kerry Mullis was first working with PCR, first discovering it, that a single copy will give you an amplification product that you can see on a gel. So it doesn't make sense then that real-time PCR is by definition more sensitive than conventional PCR. The reason that is in the literature is people develop a real-time PCR because they specifically want to figure out how many copies of their target they have. So they specifically design their primers to amplify as few copies as possible. Depending on how the primers are designed, they may be more or less sensitive. And so in a lot of cases, you have a conventional PCR where the primers themselves have not been optimized. And that conventional PCR is then compared to the real-time PCR primer pairs, which have been optimized. And so in the literature, when they say that real-time PCR is more sensitive, what they are referring to is comparing apples and oranges. And so it's, it's not a fair comparison and it's not the truth. Sensitivity um, down at the limit of detection, which is, you know, depending on your primer design, one copy per reaction. Um, the most sensitive that you can get is one copy, but the theoretical limit of detection is three copies. Because if you imagine having a template where only one copy of your template exists per 10 microliters of sample, then you can imagine that as you're pipetting your template into your reaction, that sometimes you will pick up that one copy, sometimes you're going to pick up more than one copy, and sometimes you're not going to pick up any copies at all. So there is a Poisson distribution for the likelihood of getting amplification when you're down at the limit of detection. So at the limit of detection, you need to perform more replications of your amplification. So in this case, here are three different reactions that I performed with dilution series of my template. And you can see that at the limit of detection, um, Two thirds of the time I got visible amplification and that is because of that plus on distribution. PCR sensitivity is going to depend on the conditions of the reaction. So primarily how well your primers and probes have been designed, but also how those primers and probes work in the environment of PCR inhibitors that are carried along with your template DNA, and also how those primers interact with the polymerase. So what polymerase have you chosen, and is that polymerase going to work well in the, um, the temperature constraints, the target sequence? So if you have a target that is very GC rich, it doesn't matter how well your primers are designed if you're using a polymerase that can't 
push through a GC rich region, you're not going to get good ampl amplification, meaning you're not going to get good sensitivity. Also, the concentration of your DNA target, um, the nature of your DNA target, so does it have a lot of secondary structure? Does the DNA itself have a function in vivo? If it does, then it's going to have not just secondary structure, but tertiary structure. So the DNA molecule um, has folded in on itself in a three-dimensional structure, and it may be harder to disassociate the two strands of DNA out of a three-dimensional structure. Then also the copy number of your target um, per organism. So are you looking at a, uh, a housekeeping gene on the genome? So maybe you only have one copy per genome of that gene? Or are you looking at a mitochondrial gene? And there are many, many mitochondria per reaction or per cell um, at any given time, hundreds to thousands of copies of that mitochondrial genome. And so in a cell where you only have one copy of the housekeeping gene, you may have hundreds to thousands of copies of that mitochondrial gene. Okay, so thank you very much to all of the people who helped me to develop this PCR series, um, my supervisors who gave me permission to do it and to make this recording for you, and my contact information down here at the bottom. Um, please do not be shy to use it. I am here as a resource for you. I have collected all of this information over 30 years and I have another 10 years of work to go, but I would like to disseminate the information. And so if you have any questions, please don't be shy about contacting me. Thank you so much.